Okay. Well, uh, thanks for bearing with me for a minute. I think I used a couple. <laughs> Hopefully not too much of my time. Um, okay, so it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you something we've been thinking about for the past a uh, few years in the role that microbes in the gut play in drug metabolism. And so if you go to your favorite pharmacology textbook, you can usually find a brief, um, although interesting, mention of microbial drug metabolism. And for example, one that's widely used by uh, pharmacologists in the industry, uh, there's a short paragraph that says that the microflora, or microbiota, and the gastrointestinal tract can metabolize a wide range of drugs, which can reduce the amount available for absorption. And then they go through and mention a lot of the known reactions uh, that can occur. Um, in Goodman and Gilman's, which is the pharmacologic basics of therapeutics, sort of like the Bible for pharmacologists, uh, there's actually just one sentence, uh, but it says, Drugs in the gastrointestinal tract can be metabolized by enzymes of the intestinal flora before they gain access to general circulation. So the point being that we, we've known about these interactions between microbes and drugs for a long time. It's known to affect uh, a variety of different compounds, over 40 known drugs. Um, but we know very little today about exactly how uh, these reactions are taking place. And so at the... Um, uh, suggestion of Lita. I'm going to spend the beginning of the talk just giving you a few examples of what uh, work has been done by other uh, members of the, of the field, and then I'll end with a more in-depth uh, story which we've uh, recently published. And so you can sort of think about these interactions between gut microbes and drugs as breaking down into sort of two different uh, types. So you think about drugs uh, and in the simplest case, an orally administered compound uh, going through the gastrointestinal tract. There's a variety of ways in which this drug, prior to absorption, can uh, be directly modified by gut microbes. In uh, the case of prodrugs that are, in, that are activated, um, compounds that are inactivated, converted to toxic byproducts, and of course, antibiotics uh, that are intended to have an effect on pathogens, but can of course have many unintended consequences for the standard residents of the gut microbiota. In addition to that, there's some very interesting indirect interactions where microbial colonization can actually result in certain microbial metabolites which go into circulation and interfere with drug metabolism in many sites throughout the body, as well as uh, effects of colonization on the expression of genes uh, by the host. And so I'll just give you a few examples of some of the characterized um, cases where this has been shown to be the case. Um, for example, in drug activation, there's a very uh, sort of famous example, which is sulfasalazine. This is a drug um, that's uh, used for inflammatory bowel disease, and it's very uh, conveniently activated by members of the gut microbiota. And this actually proves to be very useful for the drug because you want it to locally reduce inflammation at the site uh, of the problem. And so you administer this uh, prodrug. Uh, which has an azide bond shown by the arrow. Uh, azoreductase is expressed in the microbiome, cleave this drug in half, and you get the active metabolite 5-ASA, and um, uh, not so conveniently sulfapyridine, which uh, is thought to contribute to the side effect of the drug. Um, we've, this is just a phylogenetic tree that, w that we put together recently, which uh, sort of makes the point that this is an interesting enzyme in the fact that it's not just restricted to one particular type of bacteria. You can find uh, enzymes that have actually been uh, experimentally validated in a wide range of different bacterial phyla, including the Firmicutes, Actinobacteria, Bacteroidetes, and, and Proteobacteria, as well as one Fusobacterium. Um, and this is sort of a, a neat assay because these same bonds are found in tattoo ink. And so if you have undergrads or somebody that you want to search for azoreductases, all you have to do is put tattoo ink in your agar and you can find these enzymes. Um, but what's kind of, so these are widely distributed and there have been papers where people actually exploit these enzymes to um, locally deliver other drugs in, in addition to sulfasalazine. Um, and yet, even though we know this enzyme, uh, and this has been known for a while, we still know very little about whether or not the inter-individual variations in the efficacy or toxicity of these compounds is mediated by uh, variations in the gut microbiome. So that remains to be explained. 
There's another really famous example which I think came up uh, a little bit yesterday, and this is work done by Matthew Redinbo at UNC. Um, and they were interested in the uh, drug arenotecan, or CPT-11. And this drug uh, has a ridiculously complicated uh, route through the body. So uh, what happens, this is used for cancer. It's administered by IV, makes it into the blood in an inactive form. It's then activated by carboxylesterases to SM38. It then gets inactivated in the liver by being glucuronidated. And then this inactive form is released back in, into the intestine. And that's where it gets sort of interesting for the microbiologists, where uh, these enzymes, bacterial beta-glucuronidases, can actually reactivate the drug in, the, in a site that you don't uh, want it. And that contributes to the dose-limiting side effect of the drug or diarrhea. And so Matt decided to uh, use what's known about the E. coli version of beta-glucuronidase to screen a, comp or a, a library of different small molecules, and they identified four different inhibitors. And this is just data from their, their paper in 2010, where they looked at um, beta-glucuronidase activity on the left in E. coli. And you can see without the inhibitor, uh, the enzyme is fine under anaerobic and aerobic conditions. And then when they add each of the inhibitors, it blocks the activity. And this is also the case for two other um, distantly related isolates, Bacteroides vul uh, vulgatus and Clostridium. They then went on to show that this actually helps in mice, which is uh, very exciting. So what they did was uh, they took animals, fed them, or gave them the vehicle, the inhibitor alone, uh, CPT-11 or CPT-11 plus the inhibitor. And as you can see, the, uh, the uh, percent of mice with diarrhea was very high when given arena tecan or CPT-11, but the inhibitor successfully blocked that. Um, and that was also the case when they just looked at histology. And you can see this is, a, this is the quantification histological score in this down here is just example uh, pictures from the paper where you can see CPT-11 causes a major disruption to the gut, and the inhibitor restores that. Okay, so the next type of interaction is, is the sort of more nebulous one where certain microbial metabolites can make it into circulation and block host drug metabolism. And there's a, a sort of an interesting example of this which came from Jeremy Nicholson's group and they uh, were looking at the drug acetaminophen. And so this is you know, one of the most widely used drugs. Probably many of you in the audience are taking it right now. And uh, it's interesting because it gets uh, uh, detoxified by the body in two different ways. Uh, it can be sulfated or it can be glucuronidated. And they noticed that if you do um, metabolic profiling of individuals after being administered acetaminophen, uh, they vary in the relative proportion of these two different forms of acetaminophen. Um, and that, that was associated with the abundance of a microbial metabolite called p, p cresol. And so this is just the negative association where if you have a high level of p cresol, you have a low level of the sulfated form of acetaminophen. And so this is uh, potentially suggesting that what happens is that uh, p cresol, which also gets sulfated, may be titrating away the enzymes in the host that are responsible for this major pathway of drug detoxification in the host. Okay. Um, we still don't really know the consequences of this, but it, it, there's a potential that um, the toxicity of uh, acetaminophen could be you know, linked to this particular metabolite. Okay. Um, the other sort of interesting example is that it's been known for, for some time that if you compare germ-free animals to colonized animals, there are, are differences in gene expression that uh, contribute to um, altered host drug metabolism. And so this was a study from Sven Peterson's group, and what they did was just looked at um, uh, gene expression again in, in uh, standard SPF mice compared to germ-free animals. And they interestingly found a down regulation, so decreased levels of expression of multiple uh, cytochromes in the liver. And then they went on to show that this actually has a functional consequence. So if you dose these mice with barbiturates, the germ-free animals recover much faster from the anesthesia. All right, so the final example I'll share with you is one uh, that we've been very interested in uh, for the past couple of years.
Um, and this is another um, um, example that's been known for quite some time. So actually 30 years ago, a lot of the seminal work linking the gut microbiota to digoxin metabolism was done. Um, but we still, um, at the time of uh, the, when we started the study, knew very little about how exactly mechanistically this was happening. Uh, so digoxin is what's called a cardiac glycoside. It has these three sugar rings here, this uh, large um, set of rings here, and you can see a single double bond in the um, lactone ring at the top right. Uh, and I should mention that all of this is work being done by Henry Hazer in the lab, who's a really talented uh, postdoc and has a poster here. So digoxin is a natural isolate from foxglove plants. It's widely used still today for um, heart failure as well as uh, irregular heartbeat. And the mechanism is that it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase in the heart. It's been of interest and really widely studied for a long time uh, due to the fact that it has a very narrow therapeutic range. And so you have to very carefully uh, dose the drug to avoid a lot of the ver very toxic side effects while still providing enough to have um, the uh, intended efficacy. And there's a range of side effects. I think just as a side note, it's sort of uh, interesting to think about. Uh, one of the uh, common side effects, which is blurry yellow vision, and uh, this is inconvenient for most people, but in one sort of famous example, which is Vincent van Gogh, uh, this is thought to be responsible for his art style. And you may wonder, you know, how, how do we know that? And the reason is that van Gogh uh, painted a lot of self-portraits. And so you can see him just sitting here staring at his foxglove plant. Um, all right, so moving on. <laughs> Um, so Agarthal lenta is uh, uh, the single uh, gut actin of bacterium that's commonly found in a lot of different people. And it was shown in 1983 to be the only organism that was culturable uh, that was capable of inactivating the drug digoxin. And this is really uh, based on some early work that had shown that there is a downstream metabolite of digoxin called dihydrodigoxin which is not capable of binding the target sodium potassium ATPA. So it's an inactive form of the drug. It's found in a subset of patients. And if you administer antibiotics at the same time as digoxin, you elevate the amount of intact drug that makes it into the serum. And so there was an argument to be made that gut microbes were involved, and Lindenbaum then went and proved that Elento was capable of doing this um, in the lab. And one of the interesting things about Elento is that uh, unlike many of the organisms in the gut that are looking for carbohydrates, Elento really thrives on arginine. So it uh, grows primarily uh, using arginine as a source of carbon, nitrogen, and energy. Um, and the interesting thing is that, as you would expect, um, as you add more and more arginine to the media, you can increase the overall growth of Elento, but at the same time, high levels of arginine inhibit the reduction of digoxin or inactivation. All right, so that was sort of the, the uh, initial framework where we, where we started. And we wanted to see whether or not understanding something about the mechanism of digoxin and inactivation would actually help us predict what's going on in the more complex situation in a complex human gut microbiota um, and potentially design a way to test in animals whether or not we could actually prevent this from happening. Uh, and so we started looking at Elenta in isolation. Um, just grown in the lab in low and high arginine in the presence or absence of digoxin. And what I'm showing you are uh, sort of RNA-seq uh, results where we're just look the height of the bars just represents the number of reads that are aligned to a given place in the elented genome. And as we look at, uh, so with the, in the absence of the drug, there's essentially no expression of these two genes, and when we add digoxin, they come on incredibly high. And uh, interestingly, the two genes that are found in this operon are uh, predicted bacterial cytochromes, and so they're potentially capable of accepting digoxin as an alternative electron acceptor. So this we got very excited about, and we sort of tentatively called them the, the cardiac glycoside reductase operon. Um, but we wanted to, to sort of look at this in a little bit more detail. And so the one thing that we noticed based on the RNA-seq and confirmed by quantitative PCR uh, was that at high levels of arginine, the operon is actually suppressed. And so we see the highest level of expression when you add digoxin and low arginine, and the levels are significantly lower in high arginine. And so that, that fits with the idea that potentially high arginine is downregulating this operon, uh, reducing the amount of drug metabolism. Um, 
The next thing Henry did was to just do an initial sort of structure function analysis. We wanted to know whether or not this was the only cardiac glycoside that could induce the operon, or if this was a conserved feature of many related drugs. And so we took uh, a small panel of digoxin um, and three other cardiac glycosides that vary in relatively subtle ways. You can see digitoxin here is just missing one of the oxygens. Digoxygenin has the, the three sugars cleaved off, and then wabane is actually um, somewhat distinct. And when you quantify the amount of induction of this operon, you find that all uh, four of them are capable of inducing uh, expression. Uh, whereas if you chemically synthesize the reduced form of each compound, it's not able to trigger uh, the expression of the operon. Okay. So unfortunately in Elenta, we don't have any bacterial genetics yet. Uh, so we didn't have a way to actually knock out the operon and prove to ourselves that this was actually responsible for digoxin reduction. And so we took sort of a comparative genomic approach. And thanks to the HMP and other um, sort of large-scale genome sequencing projects, uh, we actually had three closely related strains of Elenta that had all been fully sequenced. So we started by just comparing them in the lab to see whether or not they could all reduce the drug. And we found that only the type strain could inactivate didoxin. And these other two FAA strains were not capable of doing this. And when we compared the whole genomes of these three strains, we found that the non-reducing strains had, uh, did not have the CGR operon, and we're also missing other interesting uh, genes, in particular these two operons for uh, potentially for the import of sugar and small metabolites. All right, so now that we were somewhat convinced that this operon was responsible for drug metabolism, we wanted to say, uh, to ask the question of whether or not that would allow us to predict the efficiency of drug metabolism in a complex human microbial community. Uh, and so at, at this point, we're not looking at cardiac patients. Instead, we designed an assay where we collected fecal samples from 20 unrelated individuals. Uh, we took these samples and incubated them with the drug in the lab, and then we measured the amount of digoxin that was uh, converted to dihydrodigoxin. And then we compared that to the relative abundance of the CGR operon. And so what we found is that you could group people into sort of two main categories. There's individuals that are relatively poor at reducing the drug, and then there are microbial communities that are relatively efficient at this, Many, most of them actually reducing all of the drug that we exposed them to. And they were, as we expected, the level of the CGR operon was significantly higher in the high reducing group of people. Okay, so next we turn to these notobiotic animal models that have been mentioned in many of the talks today uh, to try to see whether or not, uh, based on our knowledge of elenta metabolism, we could actually prevent this from happening in vivo. Uh, and so the rationale was, uh, was relatively simple. So we know that if you add arginine to the media in the lab, it blocks digoxin reduction. And so the sort of obvious question is to ask, if you add more arginine in a mouse, do you also stop reduction? And so uh, we did an initial experiment where we have germ-free animals that are all colonized with the type strain of Elenta, and then we, t we transferred them from a standard chow onto two different diets that were relatively extreme. So we have a 0% protein and 20% protein. And the prediction, again, is that we should see higher levels of digoxin on the 20% protein diet. And indeed, that's what we saw. So when we quantify digoxin by ELISA in the serum as well as the urine, we see dramatically higher levels on the high-protein diet. We wanted to just make sure that this wasn't a nonspecific effect of colonization or, um, or the two different diets. And so we designed a second experiment where uh, germ-free animals are either colonized with the type strain or with one of these non-reducing FAA strains and placed on the same two uh, diets. And the, the results made sense. So we saw, again, higher levels of serum and urine digoxin in mice colonized with the type strain, but not in mice colonized with the non-reducing strain. And in the case of serum digoxin, we saw significantly lower levels between comparing the two groups on the 0% protein diet. All right. So this is all sort of, um, we hope, building towards a model of digoxin metabolism that takes into account um, differences in colonization between individuals in the sense where some people, we think, are uh, may be colonized predominantly with strains that lack the CGR operon and are incapable of metabolizing the drug, and so the level of digoxin that's administered remains intact, uh, whereas other individuals that uh, carry uh, uh, strains like the elanta type strain that, that have this operon, 
are capable of uh, converting the drug to dihydrogatoxin, yet at the same time, based on the amount of uh, perhaps dietary protein and arginine, uh, that can inhibit this reaction. And so um, if you want more information, I would encourage you to go to poster uh, P14 um, and also the paper which came out uh, last week. Um, okay. So with that, I'll turn to some needs, gaps, and challenges. Um, I think my need is relatively simple, and I think this has been covered by most of the talks today, so I don't have to go into more detail, but the, we've, uh, over the past, I guess, nine years or so, uh, been uh, interested in combining these metagenomic studies of humans and animals with detailed and controlled studies of notobiotic animals, and I think that's a useful sort of paradigm to go back and forth um, to develop useful hypotheses based, that are grounded based on human data but have the ability to test them in, in animals. And building on what Sarkis said, I think one of the real challenges for us is that um, in addition to genetic drift, we deal with the fact that there's no you know, repository where you can obtain germ-free animals. And so we're really dependent on uh, really one company, Taconic, which provides wild-type germ-free animals to researchers for a pretty hefty cost. Um, and, you know, a few labs that sort of generously distribute these animals around the, around the world. So there's, you know, unlike uh, cultured bacterial isolates or normal mice, um, if one researcher re-derives a mouse of a certain genotype germ-free, there's no sort of central repository where you, can, where you can put that mouse where other people will be able to share that after you publish your data. And, and that would be incredibly useful, I think. All right, so these are really scientific gaps. I think the, the questions that we're very interested in are, are identifying the key bacterial or microbial taxa and metabolic pathways that are involved in xenobiotic metabolism. We still know very little about how microbial communities adapt to these very toxic compounds. This is obviously uh, fairly well understood for antibiotics, but we know um, incredibly little about how other drugs that we take are um, influencing microbial community structure and function. Um, and we also would like to get at, you know, estimating the relative contributions of host, microbial, and environmental factors to pharmacokinetics and dynamics. And so if I can end with just sort of a, a sort of grand challenge for pharmacology, is that, you know, I've, we obviously know a tremendous amount of pharmacology. Anyone that's ever looked at this book uh, will be instantly awed by the amount that, that has been learned over the past hundred or so years about um, individual variation and how uh, uh, variations in the human genome influence metabolism, uh, how exactly uh, drugs traffic throughout the body and how they affect um, disease. Um, but hopefully in the future, we may be able to move towards a metagenomic basis of therapeutics uh, where we, you know, not only account for variations in the human genome, but we also have a deep understanding of how microbial colonization influences this process. All right, so with that, I just want to thank uh, the Center for Systems Biology. It's been a wonderful place to be for the last three and a half years. And of course, uh, uh, the, the great uh, group um, in the lab. Henry, uh, who is here and presenting his poster, um, has, you know, really was responsible for all of the work on digoxin. I told you about um, our funding sources, including the NIH. And uh, just a, a brief plug for a Keystone Symposium, which is coming up in April of next year, which uh, will go into drug metabolism, antibiotic resistance, but also, I think, just represent a broader array of speakers that will address the importance of microbial metabolism for a lot of aspects of health and disease. And so hopefully I'll see a lot of you there. Um, thanks so much. So the doc is open for questions. Peter, uh, not so much a question, but just uh, addressing your need. Uh, there is an Office of Director, um, used to be NCRR, uh, comparative medicine funding to our uh, notobiotic facility at University of North Carolina that is designed as a relatively small um, uh, source for people to use notobiotic uh, mice. Now, the problem, I agree, is central repository we're limited by space uh, 
but certainly are trying to do frozen embryos, uh, mm -hmm. and that would be one cost uh, saving way of, of having a central repository that could be brought out on demand. Uh, not immediately like a bacteria, but still uh, uh, could, could be a, but, but I would encourage people that need notobiotic resources to contact me. Yeah, yeah, and I would agree, and thanks for all the help with the, the experiments I showed today. Is there no more questions? Oh, actually, I, just, um, I wonder if you could speculate a little bit on what are the natural substrates for some of, of these microbial enzymes and, and how can you fit that into thinking about you know, how these activities are being selected for in particular microbiomes? Yeah, that's a great question and you know, that was, I had sort of a laundry list of, obviously there's many more questions than the three I, I told you about, but you know, that's something we're very curious about. And in the case of digoxin, um, you know, based on sort of predictions of protein structure for these two members of the operon um, and w what's known based on sequence homology, uh, I guess our working hypothesis is that one of these two uh, proteins um, is uh, potentially capable of accepting fumarate as its intended electron acceptor and that based on sort of structural similarities in the uh, unsaturated ring of digoxin, it may be able to sort of sneak in as an alternative compound. But we, you know, have not, it's all speculation at this point, I think. But it's, it's sort of tempting to, at least in, in this case, imagine that perhaps these enzymes are intending to target a more standard substrate that's found in the body, but are sort of cross-reacting with these drugs. So I'm just <clears throat> curious where digoxin absorbs into the body and where E. Uh, lentas colonizes. So th those two weren't really put together well. No, that's a great question and something that we are planning to look at in more detail. We, you know, we've looked at in mono-associated mice, you can obviously detect E. lenta throughout the length of the gut. Um, but we still, you know, based on sort of the classical view of the pharmacokinetics of digoxin, the idea is that it's primarily absorbed in the small intestine, but we, we just haven't looked at that in enough detail yet in mice. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. And our uh, final talk for this session is from uh, Wendy Garrett, also from Harvard University, um, who's going to talk about uh, the regulation of colonic T-cell homeostasis by microbial metabolites.